So many stayed after this long day. It's been like a four-day marathon. How, ma how many have been here for all of the four days? Oh, like half. Yeah. I was here for the first two, so it was excellent. Thanks, Alexi. Uh, okay, so this talk is uh, titled Life Beyond the Illusion of Present. And uh, as John Archibald Wheeler said, like time is what presents, uh, is, it's what pr pr prevents ev ev everything from happening at once. And this talk is really about the concept of time and, and sort of exploration of what time is and, 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 and um, sort of our perception of reality in a way. It, it's, sort of, it's sort of divided into, in, into two different parts. The, the first part, we, we discuss the physics, the, psycholo the, 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 the psychology and the philosophy of time and the present. And in the second part, it's sort of the, the boundary might be a little bit fuzzy. But in the second half, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm going to talk about how I think that we need to to completely change the way we, we think about time and how we need to model it explicitly in systems. We can't hand, hand wave it any longer. We've been doing that for way too long. And that has profound implications, I believe. And uh, we've sort of been trying to fake it. And now it's time to wake up. So this is a sort of, sort of a, wake, a wake up call. And I will, I will probably almost ask equally, if not more, questions than answers. So hopefully there will be some food for thought. So I've spent the last 10, 15 years building our large scale sort of distributed systems, enterprise systems, and I really come to the conclusion that the time, and so then sort of the present, the idea of the present is really nothing but a really sort of stubborn illusion. Okay, everything we see, we hear, we hear and we feel is it's only sort of echoes from, from, echoes from the past. But this illusion has really influenced the way we think about and model the world and view the world in so many different ways. And I believe that it, sort of this simplified view has been sort of, sort of inspired by Newton's physics. I don't know if you're familiar with, with, with Newton's physics, but in his sort of world, his universe, so sort of time is, mar is marching forward so you, uni you uniformly and, and sort of linearly sort of accruing knowledge along the way. And time is something that is absolute regardless of the perspective of the, of the viewer, regardless where, everyone, where the viewer or the observer is, everyone is experiencing the same now, okay? And I believe that this model is very appealing to us. I mean, we, we, we humans are naturally really bad at multitasking. Like, we are bad at thinking co concurrently, and it's sort of easier for us to think about time as something that is absolute, okay? It sort of maintains, it feels like, we get to maintain like control of the of the present in some way, make like being control of now, which is feel like comforting in many in in many ways. I think, and, and I think this also this model made perfect sense in computer science when we had single core processors. This is John von Neumann, in, and in 19, in 1945 he 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 introduced the von Neumann architecture. I don't know how many here are, like, are familiar with that. At least in in the reading about, about it at the, un, at the university and so on. And, and, and the, the von Neumann machine had like a total ordering of instruction, working, working on a sort of array, of, array of memory, a, a word at a time, sort of linearly, okay? And it's, it assumed like a single process updating mutable state and that we were in full control of the present, essentially like mimicking Newton's universe. And back then, like, life was good. But then, uh, unfortunately, along came concurrency then and made life miserable again. I, I mean, I can, I can, I can, so I, I can, I mean, I've, been, I've experienced this sort of this, uh, this comic strip countless of times, right? That, that the sort of highs and bugs like race conditions and all these, all, all these type of things. And then, then Jim Gray came and say, came and saved the day. So we got tr transactions to make sense of concurrent processes. Like transactions gave us like the illusion of having ordering within transactions, even though they are they are they run they might run more than more than one, but disorder like across transactions. And and you know as we got sort of acid and acids like isolation provides consistency here, and this gave us sort of our linear time back. Like we like brought us back into our comfort zone, and we everything felt good again, right? We 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 actually could could maintain control, okay? We were we were back in our in our comfort zone. Excellent. So can we go home now? 
unfortunately, I mean, or I would say unfortunately, we got more possibilities, but that, that then came like distribution, distributed systems. And also we made life miserable again, because the problem is that transaction work very poorly in distributed systems. And they, they, they're, they're, they're brittle, they're not scalable, they're not available, they're really hard to make available at least, and we need to bend over backwards to, to, to really make it, make it work. And uh, it's really, I think there's really nothing to be, to be surprised about because it's really not how the world works. It's sort of, we're trying to like fake it and, 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 and make our life sort of easier for us, like, but the illusion is like catching up on us. Like, like we try to run away from this, like, like this wolf pack, by sort of chasing us behind, and they will eventually caught up, you know, they catch up with us. I think. Uh, so the problem here is that there really is no absolute present, at least not sort of a single globally consistent present. We do not experience the same now, the same time. Okay, we it's all based on the perspective of the viewer. Uh, I believe you know it's been it's been said that a future is a function of the past. The first uh, reference to this was was by this by a guy called Robertson. He was an Australian math teacher, and um, I think this sort of the what it tries to say is that the this future function does not change the past. Okay, and I think it's 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 on the it's on the it's on the right track. But I would rather say that. The local present is a merge function of multiple con concurrent pasts. I believe that is more accurate. Like we can we can let that sink in a little bit, and if if it, if, it, if it helps, I wrote it up as, as Scala code here. Um, it's sort of it's sort of the local present in, in sort of in, can be more like as, as a, like a left fold using a merge function over all the observed concurrent pasts. This is sort of I think the the world that we actually live in. At least the best approximation or model that 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 that, that we can get. So I think what, what we really need to do is then we need to explicitly model the local present as facts derived from merging of multiple concurrent pasts. Okay, that was a mouthful, but I'll I'll try to like explain why and how in this in this talk, and, and hopefully it will be be fairly clear why I think we need we need to do this. So, 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 so taking a step back now, information is really always from the past. When, when we think about it, it's really true for everything that we observe. I mean, when, when you do observe something, it's, it's always, always already happened, often actually quite some time ago. So we're always sort of like looking into the past or listening into the past, right? So it's, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. I'm just an older, sort of worn out, almost worn out sort of uh, quote, but, but that's really what it is. And the present is something that is relative. So in a way, I think the truth is actually closer to Einstein's universe, Einstein's physics, where everything is relative to the perspective of the viewer. Where time is something that is not absolute, but actually marches forward like sort of uh, relatively based on, on the perspective of the, of the, of the viewer. And uh, th th this is, uh, by the way, uh, Einstein together with Kurt, with Kurt Gödel. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a book cover from a, from a book I read a couple, a, couple, a couple of years ago that I found really interesting. It's, it's called The World Without Time. And it got me thinking a lot about these things. You know, you know Gödel was his lo logician. Uh, he was doing math most of his life, but at, the at, his, at his later years, when he, when, when, when he fled from the Nazis, like across a half globe, right, he en ended up where, um, sort of living close to, to Einstein in, in Cambridge, I think it was. And they became close friends. So the last, the last years of, of his life, he, he actually spent um, sort, of, sort, of, sort of exploring the concept of time and, 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 uh, and the relativity. And actually, actually proven that time is actually just an illusion, at least according to, to the book. I haven't read the, his original papers, but, uh, but 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 really, information is something that has latency, right? It's not, we're not just always looking into the past. It's actually it's actually it's a fact, like that the information travels at the speed at the speed of light, and this is, as we as we know now. I mean, some some years some some years ago, well, it was perhaps more sort of an esoteric fact that everyone knew, right? But today, it's a fact that everyone that writes system need need to take into account that you know you know the round trip time to to send data between data centers, like um, I don't know, Tokyo, um, London, or or New York. 
and so on. Uh, it, it actually takes, it's actually noticeable that information has latency. Uh, and, and I think that sort of the cost of maintaining this, this illusion can be defined as two things. First, contention. There's a lot of waiting or, or for like, or like queuing up so, so for, for, for shared resources. Okay? And the, the second one is coherency, so the delay for data to become consistent. And uh, this does not just affecting our daily life, just as well as, as computer science. I think, I think we all sort of experience this, really, when we talk to people and, and try to have, have data consistency. And most people probably have heard about Amdahl's law. That's sort of the effect contention has on parallel systems. So the, you know that contention, high contention can, can give sort of dim, dim, diminishing returns. That when you start adding more, more, more CPUs or more, more computing power, it doesn't scale linearly. That's sort of the, 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 the dotted line here. But what most people don't take into account is, is coherency. Coherency can actually give you negative results, right? Where, where, where adding more resources actually just adds the work that, that need like maintaining consistency completely eat, eats up uh, the benefit. So 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 it's actually like 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 this like sort of the the solid the solid line there that you actually um, yeah decrease performance and decrease scalability by adding more resources. And this is sort of also sort of, I think pointing in the same direction. We need to give up. Um, it's our grip on Newton's universe, really. And uh, as latency gets higher, I think this illusion just, just, just cracks more and more and more. And, and you know, the difference in a distributed system is, is, is a lot greater than, than on a, in a, in a, on a, on a multi-core system, even though we can actually experience it there as well. So I really, re really believe that now when, when everything is distributed systems, I mean, there's really no way of escaping that. It's, it's, it's okay, okay if you write pacemakers or, or, or like embedded systems, it might not be. But if you write web apps or enterprise systems or, or most type of systems today requires some sort of uh, going across the network to the database or, or calling out to, to services over REST or whatever or actually being available and you need to do replication. And, and, it's, and, and, you, and, and you know, so I think really it's, it's nowadays it's all di dis distributed system. The way I view it, and I sort of the, the way I've learned to view it through, through the lens of reactive systems as well is that it's, it's, it, it's either, everything is really distribution. It's either like distribution sc sort of scaling out on multiple cores or it's scaling out on multiple machines. Like you either have the, 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 the QPI link between your two processors and, and that adds latency or you have the network between the two processes, right? So, 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 so if you have a model that actually takes this into account, uh, then, 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 then you have a model that works equally good for concurrency, for just interleaving, for parallel systems as well as for distributed systems. Sort of, sort of, sort of a, a sidetrack that I won't explore more here, but it's, it's something that I, re I, re I re really believe in. So I think this really is like puts a harsh end to, the, to this illusion. We can't just afford freezing the world any longer. I mean, it, it's, just, it's, just, it's just too costly. We need to give that up, I believe, and stop shoehorning everything back into Newton's, Newton's universe. Because we, and also, we, we all know that the network is reliable, right? One of the fallacies of Peter, of Peter Deutsch. Not really. I mean, as soon as you add in the network, things will fail in spectacular ways. Messages will, be, will get dropped, usually often as part of the, of the, of the, of the protocol to do, to do throttling and, 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 and back pressure and stuff like that. Uh, or messages will be re reordered, duplicated, and, 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 and we, we need to have protocols that really takes this into account. So it's, it's hard, but I really think that we can't ignore it any longer. So this is sort of a, f a famous uh, feel like philosophical quote. I don't know if you've, if you, if you, if you've heard it. Uh, if, you're, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? And, and the, the, the question is really, how I interpret it this, interpret this anyway is, is can something exist without being perceived? Uh, 
Einstein, while, while, I mean, you know, he, he, he wrote a lot of letters, like, not emails, but actually physical letters. And one of the, one of the guys that he was, he was com like, having most conversations with was, was, his, what, what his friend, what was his friend Niels Bohr, a Danish physicist. And, and, and in, in one of these letters, Einstein asked Bohr, do you believe that the moon does not exist if nobody's looking at it? And Bohr answered, however, you, however hard you may try, you can't prove that it does. And I, I, I really, I mean, you can dismiss this as sort of, yeah, this is sort of a metaphysical, I mean, just philosophical question. But I believe, I actually believe that it's not. Actually, I think it directly affects how we build computer systems today. Simply because information can and will get lost, right? And as I said before, like, network drops and splits really lead to drop packages, failed nodes, like, malicious nodes if you take, like, Byzantine fault tolerance into, into account. And it, now, if this, lost information then is, is actually facts about the past, okay? What does that mean? Does it mean that certain pasts have, has never happened? If we can't observe them, how do we know, okay? And then what does that mean for our present? We know that sort of the future is a function of the past. What does that mean then? How can we make sense of, of, the, of, of the present? So we can, we, can, we can perhaps get some sort of help through just thinking about how do, how do we deal with information loss in, in real life, right? Well, how do we do it every day? We, I think it's, how, what do we do when we just receive partial information? For example, I mean, I don't know how many was out in the bar yesterday and I talked, it was like some, some noisy bar perhaps, and we, and we don't really hear each other that, that well. We usually sort of wait for more information and, and, or, or we ask again. And, uh, and we might receive the same or additional information that we can, so we can make sense of what was said. We do not aim for guaranteed delivery, if, if you would take it like a worn out uh, computer science term. Instead, we, 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 we naturally use or at least once deliver, delivery with item potency, really. That's how we all behave, right? That's how, how it all works when we communicate with each other. And at, at an early age, we, we learn to, feel, to like to take educated guesses, and if we were wrong, we fill in the blanks. No, no, sorry, educated guesses to partial information and fill in the blanks, okay? What we think someone said, and, and, and we try to make, make sense of things. And when we're wrong, if we, we, which we often are, we take compensating actions for that. This is very natural to us. So we, we, to sum up, we take decisions always on partial information sometimes duplicate information, and we take compensating actions if things, if we, if, if things didn't made, made, made any sense, right? And this is what Pat Helen calls our apology-oriented programming. That, 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 that you actually take bets, and if you're wrong, no big deal. I mean, you just apologize and continue. And, the, and if the protocol is written in a way that that is okay, then, then life moves on. Right? Even if we, if we were wrong. And if we think about it, this is how a lot of systems work. How many have, have, have experienced like overbooked flights, for example? When, when, you, build, like, when, when you even you know you have, you have your ticket, you didn't get um, to, to, to go on the, on the plane, right? Because airlines do this all the time. They, they, they overbook the flight and then they sort of ask for forgiveness. They try to bribe us, like giving us vouchers and stuff. That's, that's, that's insane. In, that they usually doesn't have much much value, unless you fly with that airline again. And that's also how ATMs work. I mean, if, if the ATM actually cannot reach the server, it will still hand out money, and then it will it will it will compensate by 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 charging you later. So the bottom line, but the the bottom line is that I I think we just simply cannot force the world into a single globally consistent present any longer. It's like, again, maintaining this illusion that we're so used to do, but it just proves too costly. Performance will suffer, scalability will suffer, reliability will suffer, and correctness will suffer. Okay? So the question then, should we just give up, right? Sometimes we might just feel like doing that. They just exit the meeting and jump out the window. I but I really believe that there is a path forward, okay? And what we need to do, I believe, is we need to treat time as a first-class construct. We just can't hand-wave time any longer. It needs to be part 
of, of our programming model, in the way we model software, in, in part of the, of the programming languages, ideally, and, and, and at least built into the, to the standard libraries and data structures and so on. So, but what is time really, then, if we should dive into that topic? I believe that, one way of looking at it, of course, you might disagree, but, but I believe that it's actually not about wall clock time, you know? Tick, 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 hours, minutes, seconds. That's sort of a half-leaky abstraction for us to make sense of the world. But I really don't think that's the essence of time. Uh, it's not, at least not, what makes us feel time. And everyone has, has experienced like when, why some, sometimes time, time just flies through the window. And sometimes it just feels dog slow and we can't understand how, that, how it can be like that, right? And I, th I, really, I really believe that when you think about it, it's usually related to the events experienced during this period of time. So, so, so I really believe that time is all about causality, so the events that happened um, uh, during this time period. So the, the succession sort of, of, of causally related events. I really believe that is the essence of time. Since we all know that time is definitely not absolute. If you send out an atomic clock going around the world a few times and bring it back then, I mean, yeah, they, diff different times have has passed. So it's actually provable, even. So the question then is then, how can we manage time? The first thing I think we need to do is that we need to work and think and design and model the world as facts. And, 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 and sort of model how facts are causally related to each other. Okay, so what is a fact? According to Merriam Webster, is a fact is something that, that truly exists or happens, something that has actual existence, a true piece of information. And what is in, so it, it represents something that has happened. And what's, inter, and, and what's important to understand is that facts just accrue, right? Facts do not change. They, they just accrue. You can just add more knowledge. And facts are Im immutable. If something's happened, it happened. It's nothing to do about it. I mean, we can be, feel sorry for that sometimes, but and wish it didn't. But but life moves on, right? We need need to take compensating actions usually and fix what was wrong. But it doesn't change the actual fact. So facts accrue, but they and they can accrue by either adding new facts to the system, or you can derive new facts from existing facts. And facts can often be modeled like, uh, like uh, sort of using dependency graphs, uh, like where you have like knowledge, like d d derived knowledge based on, on, on knowledge. Like in, and, and, and there are the data structures that allow you to do that, like uh, data flow graphs, for example. You can um, futures or, 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 or the data flow variables is one, is one way of doing that, for example. This is also how, in a way, how persistent data structures work. That 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 so sort of closure is sort of pop popularized. Phil Phil, Phil Bagwell brought to Scala, and and uh, it's also for example how, how Git works is a nice way of modeling the world, with immutable like, the dependency graphs, I believe. But 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 in order to make sense of this at all, we need to stand on so on, on solid ground. I, th I think immutability is a requirement. Is the really the only way we can make sense of the world? And, and unfortunately, the traditional object-oriented languages don't help us much with this. They treat value and identity as, as, the, same, as, as the same thing. And, 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 and I think mutable state sort of is something that, that doesn't, met, it doesn't sort of make much sense as a general programming model that we should use everywhere, I think. It's something sort of that we invented as to make life easier in a way, right? Easier in quotes, like at least when, when, we, when we like are in Newton's universe, we're like, then, then it might actually work. But, but, but we all know that, 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 that as soon as you, write, as you run multiple threads or, or, or start passing this around the network or whatever, things start to fall apart. I think we really need to ba base our understanding and modeling on stable values, code that doesn't lie in all these things. So then the question is then, do variables have a purpose in, in life at all? Uh, uh, John Backus, he said in, he, he said in his Turing Award lecture in 1977 that the assignment statement is the von Neumann bottleneck of programming languages and keeps us thinking a word at a time, in a word at a time terms, much the same way as a computer bottleneck does. A, a word at a time. I mean, so the assignment operator now is trying to shoehorn our, ourselves back into Newton's universe again, 
That's really what it's, what, what it's trying to do. And this implies sort of global, mu global mutable state. And this is why we always need to go through like adding cr like critical sections everywhere. If you use like, you know, regular Java concurrency or C++ concurrency. Um, of course, there are better ways than doing like Rust. Rust's ownership system is extremely interesting, for example. But if you look at like traditional ways of doing it, so, 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 what do I think? I mean, is, is mutable state some, the only like evilness? I, I don't, I, I don't think that is the case actually. I just, I think it has its place. It's actually easy to 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 work and to reason about in 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 a box. So, I just need, I think we need to make sure that it's contained. If 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 you if you, it's perfect like for local com, 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 computations, then it's totally safe. But as soon as we have sort of worked out some computation, then we produce a fact that is immutable, and we publish that out to the rest of the world to, to watch. And then, it's, then we can touch it, and we can touch it, but then we can't change it any longer. So, so that, I think that's really the way we need to work with, with mutable state. So how do we store it or, and organize facts? Yes, we, um, I mean, a lot of people, as I said, join the Scala tour, uh, the two Scala days, uh, of a lot of talks. I'm sure you talked about func 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 functional programming. Functional programming is like based on lambda calculus and all these things. I'm sure you know all the, this. I think functional programming is a great tool for, for working with values and facts. It's sort of a fact machine, right? You put facts in a function and you get facts out. And as long as you stay true to that and only work with, with, with Im immutable values, mutable can actually be done safely in certain, at least, context languages within the function, right? But as soon as you public, you get the result out, you need to be tr tr treat it as an immutable val val value. Uh, logic programming, I believe, is also, um, even though it is, that has not, unfortunately, not being that, that widely adopted, uh, uh, I really love logic pro programming. I think it's the ultimate tool for managing facts, actually. You only, only, only define the properties working on facts, and, and, and then, you, then you let the, 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 so the runtime just take care of how, like resolving the different rules and, and within, within the constraints that you have defined, essentially. And you feed it with facts and, and outcomes facts. So, so. Data flow programming, I already, already talked a little bit about. I think that's, all, that's, that's also an interesting model. But the, the first rule of facts is that we should, can never ever delete a fact. I've already touched about this, but it's really worth re repeating. It's, it's always sometimes very, very tempting to start deleting facts. Because I really believe by deleting facts, we delete our past. And, you, and we already said that the past is our only way to the present. So it doesn't sound like a really wise thing to go around and deleting the past, I, I believe. And, and I think this also, so th this means that I really think there's no reason to use in-place update any longer. Like, like, like we we used to we are used to do using regular relational databases. I, I, I it can can really be convenient sometimes, but I really think it's wrong. And Jim Gray said in his in his like seminal paper that the transaction concept from '81, where he introduced transactions that. I'm going, to read, I'm going to read the quote here. Uh, when bookkeeping was done with clay tablets or paper and ink, accountants developed some clear rules about good accounting practices. One never alters the books. If an error is made, it's, in, it's, in, it's annotated, and a new compensating entry is made in the books. The books are thus a complete history of transactions of the business. Update in place strikes many system designers as a cardinal sin. It violates traditional accounting practices that have been observed for hundreds of years. Still, I mean, this is what we, at least I am, guilty of been doing for years, right? Because it's convenient, but it's just wrong. I really believe that CRUD is dead. We don't need update and delete. We, we can just use create, we can create new facts and append them to the history. And we can read at any point. So C and R are fine, but, 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 but there's really no reason to update meaning in place and delete facts any longer. Because, because I mean, one of the reasons why you had to do update in place, I mean, if you go back in history, they, they, these guys were not stupid, right? They had, they had, they had, they had a, a reason. It was because memory constraints, right? So, so, so often, you, that was the only way you can actually write working software. So, 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 but I think today, still holding on to this view of the world makes no sense because 
Disk space is so incredibly cheap. Often you can actually even suck in the whole database in memory and just use it there. Uh, this is also a great quote from, from, from Pat Helen's Accountants Don't Use Erasers paper that when he said the database is a cache of the subset of the log. And, and, and he talks about SQL, SQL, about SQL data, databases. So the, the, the question again is that why work with a cache of a subset when we can work with the real thing? Often databases, you know, they use, they use transaction logging under the hood, append only. Every trans all transactions are, 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 are stored, they are ordered, but, they, but, but what is exposed to us as developers is usually only an updating place model. And if we, want, if we want something else, we need to create extra tables where we store historical data, denormalize and these type of things. So I really think that one of the best ways we can manage facts and manage, uh, sort of uh, make sense of the world really, is to store facts in order in an event log. An event log can be done like in, in a SQL database, or we can use something that's more specialized for it. That doesn't matter. This is all about like ideas and patterns and the way to think about things more than like exactly how things should be implemented. In a way, like the, the, the log is really just a database. It's really the database of the past, right? It's not just the database of the present, like most SQL databases are being used today. today. Like the snapshot now, but actually everything. So, so log allows us sort of to actually go on a journey through time. You know, the log ID can be can be seen so uh, sort of as a concept of time, We're like like ticking forward, like tick by tick by tick by tick. So it's really the causally related succession of, of events, right? Events in the event log. And if you remember, that is actually the way we define time earlier in this presentation, the causally related succession of events. So I really believe that the. A uh, really nice way of viewing the, 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 sort of the, 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 the world of the past and, and, and the present and time, the essence of time is actually to store events in, the, in, a, in an event log. And, and also, I mean, since all history is kept around all the time, it allows arbitrary time travel. And we can even replay the history like, and, 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 if, and find out what went wrong or for, for auditing purposes, for debugging, for replication, like replay it on another machine, like bringing the state up, up, to, up to being like, sorry, bringing an object up to speed and so on. Another interesting question then is then, can we rewrite the past? You know, the, sorry, the, the past is always sort of biased and subjective. Like, it's always the winners that get to write the history, and the history books actually do get rewritten sometimes based on new information. But, but in, and in, and in computer science, we, we can rewrite, you know, we can go into the database and, and tamper with that. But that does, does that mean that we should? Sometimes, I mean, there are exceptions, I guess. But, but, but as a general rule, I think we should not. Like, rewriting the past means actually changing the present. Because we know that the, the past is the, our only path to the present. Sometimes we actually might want to do that, but it, it, often it doesn't make much sense, actually. Like, just like, like, like what kind of mess they did when, it, when, they, when they went back and tried to fix things in this, in, this, in this movie. I just watched it with my son, and they actually did enjoy it, even though it's like from the early 80s. Uh, so, so I will, I will also believe that we need to shift our focus, like for thinking about data at rest, to, to data in motion. Okay, and and, and because it, it's it's in, it's in, it's when data moves that I think that's most of the interesting things are happen, and I also think that sort of that allows and also forces us to model the world as it is really, we, not like static data, not like snapshot of now, but actually with, with, with data that flows and that moves and, 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 and this, this sort of, sometimes we, we need to drink from, from the fire hose and you know, you know, and the streaming is a very hot topic nowadays and, and I'm sure it's been covered in the last two days like of big data, you know, like we have things like Spark Streaming, Flink and, and, and the Lambda architecture and, and distributed stream processing frameworks like you know Storm, SAMS, IS4, and stuff like that, and and we have the React Streams initi initiative that that, that TypeSafe have been part of of, of 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 doing the specification for, together with Netflix and and Pivotal and Red Hat and and and, and some other uh, in, 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 implementers of that is like yeah you know RxJava, Java, Arca Streams, and so on. Uh, 
And, and I think all these, that's, this is all good, right? Because these, all these frameworks, they force us to think about time. They force us to think about a model causality. And, and they also force us to design systems that are loosely coupled. And uh, I also think that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, 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 that later, they also force us to, 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 to think about different cons cons consistency models because we can be fully consistent within the log. There, there we have strong consistency. We have like single, single writer, right, append only. But between the different logs, because you will most likely have different logs, you have eventual consistency. And this is like two very powerful tools that, that, that we should, at our disposal, that we should use, like, and, and make, make sure that we, that we make sense of. Uh, I think it's great to allow time, actually, to diverge into different sort of event logs, into different streams, and evolve independently, right? But at some point, we need often to, like, to, to sync back. And, and agree sort of on, on, um, on at least a temporary shared view of the world, okay? And then w and that is when we need consistency, okay? Oops. So, am I boring you, by the way? Or, okay. Uh, I have a lot to cover, but um, good. So I'll, I'll, I'll just continue. So, so what is consistency then, and, and why, and when, and all these things? I think maintaining consistency means that we need to employ some sort of coordination, okay? And, and, and the, the, the problem is like too much coordination can violate, sorry, too little coordination can violate consistency, uh, correctness, right? And too much coordination can really make things dog slow or even brittle. Well, it's too strongly coupled. So coordination is really, really expensive, and it's also hard to get right, especially in, in a distributed system. It's very costly, okay? So, so, so what, I, what, 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 what I think this needs for us, like, in, in, in practice, that the, we, need, we, we need to start when we design a system to define our unit of consistency. In, I mean, what is, what is our, our, like, sort of minimum unit that, that can be strong, we, uh, that can be strongly consistent. I mean, you know, so the, ex the other extreme is, is, a, is, is the way we're used to write systems, uh, using single SQL database. Then our, our consistency boundary, you know, is, is the whole universe. But that is very hard to scale, that's very brittle, it's hard to, to, to make performant, and so on. So I think what we need to do is like try to minimize our unit of consistency and think about decomposing the system into consistency boundaries. And, and what's, what, what's important to, to think that, to know that this consistency, within this consistent boundary, we can be fully transactional, we can be strongly consistent, everything is like, we're back in Newton's universe for this, this little island, so to speak. And, this, and everything here now has to be moved as a whole, be replicated as a whole, because as soon as we start partitioning that, it's almost impossible to keep things con con consistent. Uh, so, so the question then is then how do we, op in optimal way, divide up our system in these consistency boundaries? Uh, Pat Tellen, once again, is one of my heroes. He, he's been he he defines a nice framework for like thinking about consistency, where he talks about inside data. That's our, our that's our current local present. Okay, our outside data. That's what he called the blast from the past. You know, information is always from the past. And then he, he has, when he, call, he calls that between services, between these consistency boundaries that I talked about, he calls that hope for the future, which I think is almost, is almost poetic. Uh, so I think that's a sort of nice model and framework to have. And, and I think, I mean, bringing some, some, sort, of, some sort of trendy uh, practical examples, like microservices, for example, I think makes good consistency boundaries. It's a pretty terrible name, actually, microservice. It's nothing about size at all. I think it's, for me, it's like, it's about three things, like single responsibility prin principle, good protocol design that's fully decoupled with the asynchronous sort of communication in between, and that they are fully isolated, okay? Share nothing. You really have these, these fully isolated sort of islands of consistency. So within, you have the present. Between, you have either the past or the future, okay? That's a nice way of thinking about it, I believe. And, and, and 
I don't know if there are any DDD uh, heads here, but 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 aggregate routes is also can be also a nice way of modeling this. You know, and aggregate this is a group of domain objects that can be looked as a single unit, where you have where where they have the, ag ag the, ag the aggregate routes sort of sort of guarding that group. And nobody and I mean touches my 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 sort of my uh, my my crew or my my troop here without going through me essentially. So he can then ensure the integrity of the of the of this component pool uh, or, or group as a whole. And so, within the consistency boundary, I think I think we can. Uh, uh, so this is sort of we. Um, so within the consistency boundary, I, I, I really I really I really believe that sort of the, the log is a great way of modeling uh, time and modeling the history. I mean, event sourcing is a, is a great tool. It's also sort of trendy. I don't know if there were any talks about that in these in these two talks. Seek URS is an extension to event sourcing, but 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 event sourcing is really is a, is a, is a, I think I believe it's a great abstraction on 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 top of the log, where where where, where sort of everything is sort of the, all state changing events go into the log, essentially, and and then some of them some sort of separate between like commands. And events as well. Events are state changing. Uh, no, sorry. Commands are state changing, while events is actually only rep rep represents a fact that something has happened. And uh, so this is also a really nice way to model, model to model the world uh, uh, within within the consistency boundary. But between the consistency boundaries, it's, st it's still a zoo. It, it's still really hard, right? But it is actually this zoo. I think that gives us availability. And that gives us scalability. The, when we start de decomposing the system into these safe islands, we actually give us a lot of headroom for scalability and for availability, which is great. But it's it's, it's a lot harder. But often we're forced into that. So I, I think to model this zoo, we really need to systems that are, that I said that are decomposed, that are decoupled. And there are two ways that I think we need to think about decoupling. The first one is decoupling in time. This means that this means like adding concurrency, you know, asynchronous message passing. Uh, concurrency can actually be, I mean, I mean, sorry, decoupling in time can mean concurrency. We can just meet interleaving, running on a single on a single thread. But I think it's, it's still a useful abstraction because it opens up for 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 decoupling in space. We actually run entities in different uh, sort of uh, universes, right? In different in different contexts. And and uh, and here a lot of sort of the reactive principles leads the way. You know, you know we have location transparency is, an, is a great tool, and there are there are nice tools that I that I advocate for, like uh, the Actor model, for example, that 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 that, held, that really gives you by by the through the computing model itself, the model of computation itself gives you decoupling in time and space because it's a model for distributed systems. So, but 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 I also think. So, so a, lot, a lot of people ask them, okay, what, but what about strong, strong consistency uh, I, I, between consistency boundaries? I mean, again, like it's, 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 it's often tempted to like pull in transactions and like across, across at least cores, right? But also sometimes actually, unfortunately, cross the network using XA and stuff like that. Don't we need that? I, I think sometimes we actually do need it, right? And then there are good tools for that, like Paxos and Raft and some of this consistency. Uh, strong consistency algorithms, and sometimes we should reach for them, but it's the wrong default. This is so important that we should not start with that. This, we might end up here sometimes. But way too often, just out of habit, and because it feels like we, it's, in, it's in our comfort zone, we reach for that immediately. And then we think, yeah, we can always like try to decompose later. And we can always, I uh, mean, you know, you know, yeah, reactive sounds good, right? And all these principles there, but, but we don't need it right now, right? We have, uh, we're under pressure, time pressure, whatever. And sure, it's possible to, to, to refactor a system, decomposing it after the fact, right? But it's really hard. And it's not actually easier to do it right from the beginning, I believe. Um, you know, you know, st strong consistency. Uh, means that we often have to sacrifice things. Like we, we have to sacrifice avail availability, for example. You know, C, the C and the CAP theorem. And, and also sacrifice performance and throughput and latency. 
And, and, and here, uh, if I may geek out a little bit, if I haven't geeked out enough, right? Here we're, sort of, we're living in sort of the looming shadow of impossibility theorems, right? Perhaps not as frightening as this, you know, the vampire or this, the Count Orlock here in Nosferatu, but, 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 I, think, but I'm, I, put it, I put up this image here because you should be scared, right? This is a scary guy, even I don't know if he looks that scary, but anyway. Yeah, because we know, again, like the network is unreliable. Right, so it's just, I mean, we have socket disconnects, temporary network or partial failures, and, we, and, and there's no way of actually knowing if, it, if, in, if the service you're communicating with is, is, is actually down, it will never ever come up again, or if it's just like if there's a temporary network drop, or if it's just being under heavy load, doing garbage collection, if it's you know, running on, on Java, and will come back just, just a second later. We need to take educated guesses about this. And, 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 and what, what makes it hard is that as Fisher Lynch Patterson, sorry, Fisher Lynch Patterson, as Nancy Lynch uh, proved uh, in the paper, the impossibility of a distributed consensus with, with one faulty process, is that consensus is actually impossible. We shouldn't even try to strive for that, you know, in, because it's actually proven to, not, to be impossible. And uh, I have a, I'm going to skip this because I'm running a little bit out of time. And 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 the cap theorem is another impossibility theorem that actually proves us proves that consistency is impossible. If you have a network, you know the cap theorem. Say like pick two out of these three. Like uh, C stands for consistency, A for availability, P for partition tolerance. If you run a, di 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 a distributed system, then you have P. So then you have the choice, regardless if you want it or not, between C. And A, you can't have both consistency and availability. It's impossible. So you should just have to embrace the fact that if you want an available system, you need to decompose it and live with the fact that it can never be consistent. There will be eventual consistency in between, which actually, as I said, if we think about things that way, can be a good thing. It can actually give us headroom for scale, making systems actually more reliable, which, is, which I think is good. Uh, dissecting CAC, I'm going to skip that now. Um, so the, 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 the first principle of successful scalability is to batter the consistency me mechanisms down to minimum, James Hamilton said. And I really believe that we should embrace eventual consistency, as I've already touched, right? We loosen up the guarantees, gives us more headroom for scale and all these things, right? And, and, and I think, I, I, once again, keep track of time is actually keep tracking of, co of causality. And, and you know, some systems rely on time, on time stamps for that. I really think that in general, synchronized clocks and time stamps is a really bad way of managing time. And 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 as, and, and, and even though some of the like most well-known databases, like in most SQL databases, actually relies on time stamps, it leads to lost data in cor in, in corner cases. It's really not a good way of managing time. Because it's really hard to keep the clocks in sync. You will always have, have, have clock skew. Instead, I think we should rely on logical time. Okay? And, and, we, and that, that's no news, right? Leslie Lamport invented Lamport clocks in 1978. Right? Lamport clocks gives us a global causal ordering between, between events. Okay? It's, really, it's really beautiful in its, in its simplicity. When, it, when a process does work, you just increment its counter, I mean, that you sort of attach. When the process sends the message, you include the counter, and when the message is received on the other side, you, you take the counter and you merge it with, with, with what you have. So you have sort of the max local and received, and then, then you increment that, essentially. And then you get a global ordering of, of events uh, uh, in the system. That's often not sufficient, though, because, because, because it's too, it, it imposes too, 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 too much guarantees, essentially. So, so, so uh, Colin Fitch in, in, in invented la, uh, sort of vector clocks in, in 88. It gives us a partial causal ordering between events. And what this get, gives us is a tool to detect conflicts in systems, which, uh, where, where history might diverge. So, so, so that, I think that's, that's, that, that is a great tool. And logical time, what that does, it gives us causal cons consistency. And I think that that is actually what we should reach for, because causal consistency is as good as we can, we can make it. That's, also, that's already proven. I can send you the, pa the papers later. It's called the, the, the CAC paper, where they actually prove that causal consistency is the best we can do. 
uh, and still be available in terms of, cons of consistency. But it's also very intuitive. Causal consistency is like is what we humans usually sort of think when we think about the world. It gives us all these things like read your rights and 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 and, we've, and, and when I've seen something, I mean, sort of the, the history is monotonically increasing and things like, and things like that. Uh, so, so the, the question is then. Uh, it's also okay. I can I can skip this. I'm just going to talk about that. That, that, that causality is actually also expensive. There are no silver bullets, uh, since we need to track a lot of meta, 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 a lot of metadata. But so it's actually very useful, but it's not a golden hammer. Once again, I don't believe in these in these things. But 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 uh, one thing that I think can help when we when we do design protocols is 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 is, is to reach for for what was sort of the sort of. Uh, Popular calls like ACID 2.0. I think it was Pat Helen that, that defined this this as well in in one, in one of his papers. You, we all know like ACID like 1.0, like traditional ACID, like stands for like atomic consistence, isolated and durable. And the problem again, that's not scalable, not available. It's brittle. But 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 ACID 2 ACID 2.0 so so de 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 defines it as being associative. A stands for associative. That means like 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 grouping, batching does not matter. Okay. <coughs> C stands for commutative instead, like this ordering does not matter. Uh, and, 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 and I stands for idempotent, means sort of that du duplication does not matter. And, and I think this, this, and D for distributed, I guess, to, just to make it like a, like a nice acronym. The, I think this is a very, really good guidance when we should define protocols and how we should define could the communication between these these consistency boundaries between these islands of strong consistency, uh, and so there are there is actually some very interesting research going on just about this. Like I don't know many I many here have heard about conflict-free replicated data types, CRDTs. Yeah, we we use them uh, we use them in 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 ACA. We have we have them in ACA in the ACA distributed data module. We use them also in in, in some of our commercial products. It's, it's actually a very nice not nice abstraction to to for for um, for managing sort of causality and and and, and making sense of data in a fully consistent way, still eventually consistent. We I mean you know that most SQL data sorry no SQL database at least that came out were key were key, were key value stores and key value stores they essentially give you one data type, that's the register. You have, you have like key value, key value, key value. And, that's, and, they, and they came with all of these nice promises, you know, available and, and super scalable, you know, and, and, and so on. But the problem is that we as developers, we're used to think about in, in, in richer data structures than just the register. We used to think about things like we have, we have counters, we have maps, and we have sets, and even graphs. CRDTs gives us that. They, they allow you to, to model sort of rich data structures, but with the same properties, uh, like, like you have like in DynamoDB, for example, or, 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 or React, and, and these like, the, React is actually adding, adding, adding CR, CRDTs. So there, there is a lot of work going on that helps us, it gives us good tool, um, con uh, contemporary research, but actually, actually that is very, very practical. And um, I, I just want to say, uh, sort of, before I, before I con conclude, that's also another sort of very interesting research branch that's, all the, that's, also, that's actually done in, in, in Berkeley, right up here, is, is uh, what they call disorderly pro programming and the CALM theorem. CALM stands for consistency as logical monotonicity. And, and, and you know, mo 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 monotonicity is that like facts just accrue, knowledge only grows. And this is, is like a distributed computing model that is based on the fact that if, if you take logic programming and, 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 and like monotonic increasing state, right, that, 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 that facts only, only accrue, then you get a programming model that is fully coordination free and that, you can, that is fully eventually consistent and that you can scale without limits, really. And what Bloom does, the language that implements this, is actually give you this safe box that, that, that you can work in and when you have, when you accidentally exit this box, when you write thing like like code that is not monotonic, for example, when you need coordination, it will you will get a compilation error. And there you know, okay, here I need to use some sort of coordination mechanism. Perhaps reach out for Zookeeper or etcd or or, or use or, or use a SQL database or something like that, like for 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 like hand, handing off data. 
And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just bringing this up because I think this is very interesting research with a language that actually treats time as first class. I think I would like to see more of that. I'd like to get this into Scala. I'd like to get more research to think about this in, in these in actually modern, real languages. Because I really believe that's the only way we, we, can, we can, as an industry, I mean, really move forward when it, when it comes to that. We, we, we just need to give up this delusion, right? So you need to, so you need to, I think so. In in a, in a way, we've been we've been sort of getting quite far. I think, and, and there is a lot of interesting research. But we're just getting started, as I said. And I hope this was like sort of food for thought. I want to inspire people to think more about these things. Think about I mean, breaking free from the von Neumann sort of baggage in a way, right? And 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 break free about the idea that everything has to be consistent all the time. And reach for good tools to make sense of the world anyway. Uh, I, we have a long road ahead of us, as I said. I think it looks quite foggy out there, actually. You know, it might be worrisome, but one thing is clear, I think, again, the time, I think, really needs to be first class. So uh, let's go exploring. Thanks for listening. Huh? Okay, yeah, some questions. Yeah, some questions. Yep. So we have a system. How uh you know, set scala basically is a round scala, it's very easy. It's a pseudo scala, it's a time scala, it's a round scala. You know, where do we find our own system? How do we run it? And uh, how can we kind of define uh as best as we can the actual system, you know, that's for the purpose of this event. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I don't know if I need to repeat the question. I mean, essentially, what, 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 what is reactive systems, in, and then I mean, what are good resources to learn more about reactive systems? Uh, first, uh, I, I encourage you all to, to go and read the reactive manifesto. A lot, I mean, a lot of people don't like my manifestos, but it was, it, was, it was written as a manifesto essentially just to, pr to provoke people, to actually have them go and read it and, and hopefully actually disagree sometimes, so we get a good discussion going. It was also a way to, like, one of the reasons why we had, why we added the manifesto in the first place was, was not to just start wars, right, and have people fight for things, but actually to unify uh, 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 diff different groups. There has been sort of the need to 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 write systems in the way that the reactive systems and the reactive manifesto defines for quite some time, and throughout many different sort of communities. You know, the, the .NET community, the Java community, Scala community, and, and JavaScript community, and so on all to realize that we need to change the way we write, we write systems. We need, we need systems that are, that are first like scalable or elastic, right? That can, that can actually make, make, make use of all, this, all, all, the, all the nice new hardware that we're getting, like running the cloud and you know, the, the, the cloud platforms actually support elasticity, just like, like, like pay as you go, so to speak. Or both scale up and down, like so to be cost efficient so we don't see, sit with more hardware or resources than we really have to. But the problem is that our software is usually not up for the job. So we need, we need to rethink our system and how we write systems there. We also need to systems that are resilient. That, that is sort of the second trait of, of building reactive systems. And this is something that we have hand weighed way too long. Right? It's something that, 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 that we sort of bolt, often like just bolt on afterwards. Actually, sometimes after we've gone into production and we start having the, four, the, 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 the first failures, then we think, oh, okay, oh, crap, we need to think about re resilience. We, we think we can buy ourselves out, out of it, right? Adding, slapping some cash on top, I don't know, turning on weblogic server clustering. That actually never works that way, that, 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 that well. Or, or something like that. That's just fundamentally wrong. We, we need to sort of design for resilience. Resilience is, is, is really by, by design. I did it, uh, that was all what my talk, uh, what my keynote for the for Scala by, by, by the Bay uh, was, was, was all about. I really believe that. I mean, failure is nothing exceptional. I mean, calling exceptions exceptions is just wrong, I think. It's all natural. Failure happens, especially if you run a distributed system, as I've already said. If there's a network, failure will happen. It's better to just have a good way of embracing it, to manage it. And this is also what reactive system is all about, like making it a first-class citizen in the programming model, a natural state in the life cycle of the application. And I really, I really believe that, that, that sort of none of, the, of these two is, is interesting or even, even important unless you have a system that's responsive, that always can respond in a timely fashion, both under heavy load 
when you try to scale as well as when things go, go, go down. So that is the third trait of reactive systems, building truly responsive systems. And, 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 and sort of the, one of the core underpinnings, it's, it's been debated if it should be its trait, uh, uh, sort of a trait or, or as, as, as it is now, or like one of the pillars in reactive systems, or if it should just be, be mentioned as one way of implementing. In my view, sort of the best way, and perhaps only the only way, and that is to build systems that are message driven. Because you need this asynchronous boundary between components in order to, to truly scale them, to be able to have the runtime actually to, to put objects out on multiple machines to scale them out. As well, you need this asynchronous boundary that message driven systems give you to, to be truly for fault tolerant. Because that, that, that allows you to actually have systems or your, your components fail in isolation without leading to cascading failures. We're, we're, and and, and, in, and if, the, if your components can fail in isolation and have a way of treating failure as just a message, they can actually notify the world that, oh, I went, I'm, going, I'm, I'm, I'm failing here. And someone else can then pick that up outside the context of the thing that failed and, and uh, act on it. And I really believe that you need this asynchronous boundary between your components and, and how fine or coarse grain they are. That's of course up to up to debate. But I believe in really fine grain error handling. So these are the four core traits like resilience, elasticity, message driven, and this will give you a nice sort of possibility to write really responsive systems. And as I said earlier, you, you, you should start going to the, reading the reactive manifesto, but that's just a very sort of basic sort of under, uh, walk through about essentially what I said. Uh, there are some great articles. I don't have anyone in my, in my head now, but, 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 but um, I don't know, if, do we have a website, the Reactive User Group, you can press post some of the, some of the, of the, of the material there. Th there's also some nice books just on, just on the way. My friend Roland Kuhn, he's actually on a sabbatical now. He's the tech lead of ACA. And he's, he, and he's, he, and he's, he's, he's on a sabbatical now trying to finish uh, a great book on, on, on reactive design patterns that I'm really looking forward to. And there are a whole bunch of other books as well. So, I don't know if that summed it up. Yeah? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if there's like a, sort of a lit, lit, litmus test for, 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 for React, for reactive. The, 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 the question was how can we know if a system is, is reactive or not. But I, 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 I believe if your system is, is really re re resilient and can scale, with, and scale up and down with load, I, I believe you probably are, have, have, are, are on the right track and you're probably I mean, doing it all right. The, the, I think the best way is actually just to like, start shooting your nose down essentially like uh, pull the plug see what we'll see see what we'll see what happens we need you need to really really test the crap out of your system uh, that's really the only way and both like adding load like crazy and see and emulate load and see how it actually scales the, the way it, the way it's, it's supposed to do as well as as I said, just pull, just pull the plug, and, 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 and there, are, there are great tools for this, like the Netflix Simian Army, for example, or the Case Monkey, the Gorilla, whatever they call it, right? I don't, even, I don't remember. And Akka has also a nice multi-JVM, multi-node uh, test kit that, that, uh, that allows you to put sort of a test conductor in between that sort of can, can fake network drops, can delay messages, and things like this. They essentially go um, through gremlins into the system that runs around and do all crazy stuff. Th that's also very, very useful. But, 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 but it's, it's in need, I think it needs to be said that building reactive system is really about going back to first principles. It's a way of thinking about how to design software and how to, and, 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 and how to architect, how to think about the world, essentially. It's almost a, phil a, phil a, phil a philosophy, and it's nothing new. It's, 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 
It's essentially how a lot of people that, that have done it right have done it since the, since the 70s. Uh, and, and, uh, but I think now is a time where we, we just can't, as an industry, can't, can't ignore all these all this wisdom and knowledge that a lot of people, like, like Jim Gray and Pat Helen, for example, uh, have, have um, you know, you know they, they, they applied all these principles in the 70s when they wrote tandem systems. Uh, so I really believe that, as I said, that it, it's completely agnostic to, to either I mean, Akka or Scala or, or, or Java or, or whatever. You can build it in almost any language. Uh, yeah. Okay. So how do we do, deal with that sort of situa situation where you, you, you want to forget something, but you only want to forget bit, bits of things in the history? Okay, you mean selectively go in and, 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 and remove uh, right. facts, essentially. Correct. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I guess, I guess when, when, you, when, you, when you have to do it, you have, you have to do it. And, 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 and uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, there are, of course, there are like tons of exceptions to everything I've said. I'm just trying to give some guiding principles. So I, I, I absolutely, I, I believe that there, there is absolutely a place for deleting uh, the history. I mean, uh, I often wish I could do that, actually. I mean, <laughs> wake, wake up in the morning sometimes. That's not that bad, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, but uh, sure. So. I mean, I mean take what everything I said with, with, with a grain of salt. And, and, um, but I, think, I, st I still think doing it just because it feels nice, right, and out of habit, and because, because we don't, we don't write, want to write system in a in, in, in sane, correct way, right, that's, I think that, that's wrong. Yeah, the, thanks for that input. That's uh, that's, an, that's 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 valuable. Yeah. You mentioned skepticism. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, que the question was if I think CRDTs has, has a future, and if I think it's the, if if, uh, if it's the way we should. If, if, we, if we should make, make, make use of them, essentially. And I, I absolutely believe that. I, I hope it's not the, I mean, sort of yeah, the, uh, the end, right? I think it's just a great starting point. And uh, there is still great, there's already great research extending beyond CR, C, CRDTs. Uh, for example, com combining CRDTs with, with, with data flow con concurrency and, and, and even in a distributed setting, like I mean, bringing CRDTs to in, in, into data in motion, which I think, is, I mean, Chris Mecklejohn has, 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 in, has, has started uh, um, uh, writing some very interesting papers on his latest research on that. Um, uh, called LASP, I think that if you want to Google for it, but but I really believe that CRDTs are, are they work right? I mean, they, it depends on the implementation, of course. But but we we use them in production within Type say for our our own uh, infrastructure, for example, as well as as as, as the conductor uh, operational uh, management tool for reactive systems that we build, all using C CRDTs under hood, and they and they and they work they work excellent. It's a great way to model state in an eventually consistent fashion that you know will always converge uh, eventually. Uh, so I, I, I encourage everyone to look at it. The REAC, uh, you know, Basho's database is also uh, have also added uh, the CRDTs as an extension to their to their key values. Or they, you know, they have they have links, uh, uh, but that that as far as, as as you could go earlier. But now you have CRDTs as well. That lets you model a lot of nice problems. And one, one thing that is worth also m mentioning when I talk about CRDTs is that one core property of CRDTs is that they compose. So you can take one CRDT and have it composed with other CRDTs, like, like, like a map of map of sets or whatever, map of, 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 of map of counters or whatever. They do compose, and they are still uh, like proven to have the same properties. And so it, they are really... That gives us a lot of power as developers to, to model things, much more than just you know, key value stores like we, a lot of people are used to. Can I ask about the warm-up on the Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. The question was about what I think about Spanner. You know, Spanner is, is Google's like almighty database, right? Spans a lot of data centers, and, 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 and one of the key sort of, uh, key traits or, or key key contributions in the in the in the paper is 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 about is like is a time uh, API called True Time, and and what they do is that they have atomic clocks circling the the globe. You know, so, so, so that are a sort of so that they use to have multiple sort of implementation of Paxos being being in sync. But what is interesting, so, so you, you can say that if that since that obviously worked, that, that I'm, that's sort of a counter example to what I said. It actually we can be actually be strongly consistent. But what is important if to understand when you when you read the paper, they actually define in the true time API time as a range. So they, what they do is they model it with 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 clock skew as part of the programming model. So I, I think I think I think it's an, it's really amazing work, and they have proven that you can do quite a lot. But I also think that it's important that that part of the API, uh, they really acknowledge that that, that 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 even with atomic clocks, having fully uh, sort of consistent time is not is not an option. And, and most people uh, writing systems don't afford having atomic clocks uh, and running around and circling the globe in satellites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the comment was by the cockroach DB uh, supports uh, implements the spanner model. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I have not had time to look into that. I've, I've just read briefly about it, so I can't comment on that. But, but, but as I said, I mean, this is this is just the way my way of viewing the world, and I, I believe that that we we need to, regardless of how we think about time, we need to start thinking about time more, um, either if it's like through a Spanner's approach or or through event logging. Um, so, hope I ha you you had some food for thought. Thank you.